Hi everyone, this short video refers to session 7 and 8 and specifically I'm going through the concepts of absolute and conditional convergence as relates to neoclassical growth theory. As you will know from having gone through these in class, there are no diagrams which relate to absolute and conditional convergence in the textbook. So it's helpful to try and think of how the diagrams could work if you were confronted with trying to understand absolute and conditional convergence. The first step, and I'm going to talk as I draw, start drawing a graph, is to recognize that convergence talks about the ability of one country to catch up to another country. Now we could be talking about catching up in terms of reaching the same levels of living standards, or we could be talking about catching up as um, in reference to achieving the same levels or the same rates of output growth. So we're going to use um, neoclassical growth theory to try and understand absolute and conditional convergence. So I'm going to label my axes, capital per person, as you know, on the horizontal axis, output per person on the vertical axis, so that's little y and little k, and I'm going to start by simply drawing a production function, a savings function, and the investment requirement line. And we're going to start by looking at absolute convergence. And absolute convergence is one of those concepts where you can think about it theoretically, but in reality it's quite unlikely to happen. And that's because for absolute convergence to occur, there's a very strict set of assumptions that would have to be met. The first is that you have two countries, so when we're looking at convergence, we're always comparing countries, and to keep it simple, we're just going to compare two countries. The first assumption is that these countries have the same levels or amounts of technology. Okay. The second is that they have the same production function. So the relationship between capital stock per person and output per person across the two countries is the same. The third is that the countries have the same population growth rates. So same population growth rates. The countries have the same depreciation rates of capital. And, and you can see how unrealistic this is getting, the countries have the same um, savings rates. And because the countries are all the same, between them, that's what allows us to draw a single production function and assume that it applies to both countries, a single investment requirement line and assume that it applies to both countries, and a single savings function which then also applies to both countries. So this is the production function for country A and B, this is the investment requirement line for country A and B, and this is an investment requirement, a savings function for country A and B. What we're going to assume is that country B has actually reached the steady state. So if country B has reached a steady state, then we can refer to that equilibrium as the equilibrium for country B, and we can show the equilibrium level of output per person, um, and that's Y, B. So for country B, they're in steady state, and if they're in steady state, then the change in output per person is equal to the change in capital per person in that country, and remember that in steady state, the growth in output per person and the growth in capital per person is constant, so the growth rates in these things are both zero. In addition, in country B, the overall output growth rate will be equal to the population growth rate, which here is n percent per annum. Alright, what we're now going to see, or look at, is what would happen if there was another country, country A, which started off, although they have the same production function, the same investment requirement line, the same savings function, country A started off at some level of capital stock per person, which was lower than the steady state level of output per person. 
So if you were to observe this country, in comparison to country B, when they started off, country A would have a lower capital per person and a lower output per person. However, country A would still be able to increase its output per person by increasing its capital per person, whereas country B, we've made the assumption that country B is in steady state. The reason why country A is able to continue to increase its capital per person is that in country A, savings per person exceeds investment per person. This means that there's an excess pool of funds available that firms can borrow from, and as they do so, they're able to expand the amount of investment that they undertake and the capital to labor ratio increases. Output per person increases, albeit at a decreasing rate. Savings per person increases at a decreasing rate because output per person increases at a decreasing rate. While the amount of investment required to maintain these higher capital to labor ratios increases at a constant rate. What we will see is that because in country B we haven't said anything about further changes to technology or further changes to the population growth rate or depreciation or the savings rates, country B is remaining at the steady state while country A is able to improve its capital to labor ratios and output per person so that eventually it can catch up to country B. And so eventually country A will be at the same steady state equilibrium as country B. And so what we can then see is that for country A, when they reach that steady state, their change in output per person, let's just lift this up here, their change in output per person will equal their change in capital per person, and that will all equal zero, and furthermore, the change in output in country A will also equal n percent per annum in the steady state. So the rate of growth of output in steady state for both country A and country B is going to be the same because in country A and country B they share the same population growth rate. The reason why this is then called absolute convergence so maybe I should just write that here so that you're absolutely clear that this is an example of absolute convergence. The reason why this is then absolute convergence is because when the two countries reach the same steady state, they will have the same amount of output per person. So eventually, although country A started over here at the lower output per person, they will reach the higher output per person. And although they started at the lower capital per person, they will reach the higher output, um, capital per person. So the one reason why it's absolute convergence is because the countries will reach the same steady state level of output per person. The second reason why it's absolute convergence is because once that steady state has been reached, both of the countries will have the same output growth rate. So their output growth rates will both be equal to their population growth rates. And because we've assumed that the population growth rates are the same in both countries, and because in the neoclassical growth model, the output growth rates is always equal to the population growth rates, except when we're considering technological change. Therefore, the output growth rates in each of these countries will be the same. So absolute convergence refers to countries being able to achieve the same amount of output per person and the same output growth rates. Moving along to think about conditional convergence, the reason why convergence could be conditional is specifically if in the countries they will have different levels of output per person but the same output growth rates. So this one is specifically going to be conditional convergence. And there are many different ways to get to examples of conditional convergence, so I'm just going to use one. And hopefully in your own time, you'll be able to think about different parameters and whether or not differences in those parameters between the countries would result in conditional convergence or not. So I'm going to start, like before, with the um, capital to labor ratio. So capital per 
person, output per person, and here we will have y for country A and B is equal to F. Okay, so what we're going to assume is that these countries, again country A and B, have the same technology and the same production function. We are also going to assume that the countries have the same investment requirement line. So this would be N plus D K for country A and country B. So what that's suggesting is that the population growth rate is the same in country A and country B, and also that the depreciation rate of capital is the same in country A and country B. And that's what allows or results in the countries having the same investment requirement line. However, what's different is we're going to assume that country A has a higher savings rate than country B. So to write that out, we're saying that little s, the savings rate, remember that in this model we assume that the population will save a constant portion, s, of its output per person, and that portion is known as the savings rate. What we're assuming here is that the savings rate in country A exceeds the savings rate in country B. What that means is that these two countries would not share the same savings function. Country A will have a savings function which lies above that of country B because country A has the higher savings rate. So I'm going to draw the savings function for country A in green. So SA is equal to SAY. And the savings function for country B, I'm going to draw in red. SB is equal to SB. And what we can see is that when these two countries reach steady state, they're going to look a little bit different. So this is going to be the steady state level of capital stock for country B, not country A, for country B. And that's the steady state level of output per person for country B. But for country A, The steady state level of capital per person is over there, and the steady state level of output per person is all the way up over here. Okay? So what you should note is that in these two countries, the country that has the higher savings rate, country A, is able to achieve a higher steady state equilibrium. And what that means is that in steady state, the output per person for country A is YA, and the capital per person for country A is KA. And further, the country that has the highest savings rate, their output per person and their capital per person is higher than for country B. Country B has the lower savings rate, and their steady state equilibrium is where their savings function intersects the investment requirement line. This is at a lower level of capital per person than for country A and at a lower level of output per person than for country A. Both of these countries have reached steady state. So like before, we can say that change in YA over YA is equal to change in KA over KA, which is zero. So that's for country A. And for country B, we can say that, and let's just keep the colors consistent, we can say that change in YB over YB is equal to change in KB over KB, which is equal to zero. So in both countries, once they reach steady state, their output growth rates and their capital, their output per person growth rates and their capital per person growth rates are equal to zero. In steady state, we also know that output per person in country A is greater 
than output per person in country B. In addition, we know that capital per person is greater in country A than in country B. However, the one thing that is the same in these countries is that in the steady state, because both of these countries are in steady state, their overall output growth rates will be the same. And that's because they share the same population growth rate. So in steady state, the rate of growth of total output for country A and country B will be equal to N percent. So whatever the population growth rate is in these countries, let's say that population growth rate is 5%, then in both country A and country B, total output will be growing at the same rate when these countries are in steady state. It's just that for country B, their output per person will be lower than in country A. And that's because country B has the lowest savings rate than in country A. But in terms of how fast their output is growing, their output is growing at the same rate, and that is equal to the population growth rate. This is just one example of conditional convergence. We say that the countries, country A and country B, have converged conditionally because they share the same output growth rate, which is equal to their population growth rate, but they would have different levels of output per person in steady state. You can also think about a situation where the countries have the same technology, the same production function, the same population growth rates, the same savings rates, but perhaps different amounts of depreciation. The depreciation rates across the two countries might be different. In that case, you would need to think about and perhaps work through a diagram to determine whether or not the countries would converge conditionally. So in summary, for ex um, I would like to say that for absolute convergence, that's a very, very restrictive state. Everything has to be the same across two countries, and they will eventually reach the same steady state equilibrium. They will share the same levels of output per person and the same output growth rates in steady states once the poorer country has caught up to the richer country. With conditional convergence, conditional convergence is possible if countries share the same population growth rates but have different savings rates, for example. Conditional convergence is also possible if countries share the same population growth rates but have different depreciation rates of capital. On that note, um, the next video that I'm going to do will probably go back and look at endogenous growth theory a little bit. And then, just so that you know, I'm also hoping to put some videos together with regards to aggregate demand and aggregate supply, which in class is where we are now heading.